Hi, good evening to everyone. Thank you for joining me. I am Dr. Philip McMillan. I have been focused on COVID and autoimmunity around COVID since early 2020. I've been trying to take the science of the disease and help people to understand a little bit more about the implications because part of the problem is, is that the public is not aware that we're going to have long-term issues around this ongoing circulation of a virus associated with immune priming from a spike protein. So we still have challenges ahead of us. And part of that process is to discuss with experts. And so just recently, I had one of the most fascinating discussions about COVID vaccine induced microbiome damage. Now, in truth, this conversation was so broad around COVID-19 and some of the work that Dr. Hazan has been doing that we didn't even get properly into the paper. We spoke about so many things, including the microbiome and the impact that it's likely to have on the health of the population. So if you're going to watch that, the link is in the description below. As usual, before we start, there are just going to be a few things that I will do. But just to highlight our focus today is one, we're going to be looking at the paper, that uh, she had done, messenger mRNA uh, vaccines affect the gut microbiome. I'm going to try and give you a bit of basic science about the intestinal microbiome, and we'll use that to give you some understanding as to what this is about. So let's start with some important updates. As usual, Humming Heroes is at the focus as to what we're doing. We're getting to number one. That's the aim. So please click on the link below, register. You'll be able to get the hardcover book in a few weeks time, but at the moment it is primarily the ebook that will be sold. So if you want the hardcover, please register anyway. You will be updated on it. Our aim is to try and get us to number one. You can see here, 23 hours to go. But even after the date, you'll still be able to get access to this incredible book combining science, nitric oxide, the importance of humming, and beautiful images for you to understand. Additionally, coming up this Thursday is going to be another of our COVID-19 360 presentations. So this is the course. And um, at the moment, we have gone through at least three of the parts um, and we're going to be adding the fourth part, which is around autoimmunity. As usual, if you are interested in terms of, this is the bit we're going to be adding, if you're interested in doing the live recording with the questions, please click on the link below. And if you want the course, please also click on the link that's in the description. So let's get back to the science as to what is going on here. This was a very important paper, and one of the things that upset Dr. Hazan was the fact that it was technically censored. They pulled it off, um, the publication, even though it was one of the most viewed um, research papers at the time. And what she's saying is that this important information is being lost because there is a conflict of interest in terms of the scientific community. You really have to listen to the interview. She really hammered it um, to, the, to the point. She really got into the details as to really what was going on. Um, but it raises some big issues. So what she was focused on, because her focus is on the microbiome and adjusting it as a gastroenterologist, but her paper was looking specifically at messenger mRNA vaccines affecting the gut microbiome. And um, this is an important question. It wasn't anything that anybody had looked at before. So again, the principle of the fact that many people say everything is fine, but they're saying everything is fine because they actually haven't done the research. That's not good enough. And then critically, when people do the research, you try and suppress the research. That really is not um, this really is not appropriate. So um, what I'll do is I'll take you through simply what it is that she's focused on and why I think that this is actually important. So let's just do a few simple basic steps. I've got here. Uh, this is from the uh, microbiota in gastrointestinal pathophysiology from 2017. This image. And it's showing here the intestines. You hear the stomach, 
then goes into the small intestine. This is about 22 feet long. It winds along and then it goes to the large intestine on the right side of your tummy. This is where the appendix is. It then goes up onto the liver. It goes across onto the spleen. It comes down and this is the rectum down here. Usually if you're passing stool, you're passing it from this lower end of the intestine. Now, what this is showing us is that actually there are not a lot of bacteria in the stomach because it has such a high amount of acid, but there are a few lactobacilli, streptococci, and some yeast that exist in that very high acidic environment. Even in the context of the small bowel, it is relatively clear of bacteria. You still have some here and you can't quite see it, but this is 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 CFU per mil. Again, you have lactobacilli, some coliforms, some streptococci. The big one that she's focused on is bifidobacterium, okay? And so you do have some in the small intestine, but where they are largely concentrated is in the large intestine. And this is about 10 to the 10, 10 to the 12 CFU. So significantly higher amounts of bacteria are in the colon. And again, the bifidobacteria is the biggie that we are focused on from her research. So that's just the basics as to what happens in the intestines. Now, specifically with regards to this um, bifidobacteria, not bacterioides, this is just an, Im um, an image just to show different types of bacteria that are inside the intestine. Um, but specifically, what this is focused on is the fact that normally when you eat vegetables and fruit, a lot of the material is undigestible because it's in the form of very complex um, cellulose material. So what happens is that in a symbiotic relationship, this, this is showing you a number of different bacteria. Some do different things. Um, but in the context of this one here, the bifidobacterium, what it will do is then break this down so it ferments it and then it produces then um, um, acetate um, and so on, which can then go into the cells lining the, um, the intestine to be used as energy. And in some cases, up to 70% of the energy that is used by the cells is produced by bacteria breaking down these complex um, things. So this is why fruit and vegetables are so important to be a part of your diet because they help to feed these good bacteria who then in turn feed the gut. This is what you call a perfect symbiotic relationship. And it's that work that is ongoing around the bifidobacteria. So we know already that the bacterial um, flora, the microbiome, is damaged by infection, okay? So that's the first thing to clarify. So the, the infection with SARS-CoV-2 has an impact on the microbiome. It's not clear exactly what the, um, the mechanism is, but based on research by Dr. Brogner in Italy, they think that it's related to bacterial toxins. And it seems that the virus is able to enter bacteria and replicate, or at least proteins and RNA is able to be produced by bacteria. Very strange. It's not normal for this to happen. But it does mean that the, the spike protein, it seems, has an impact on bacteria. So the question would then be is that if you're seeing that with infection, could it also happen? with vaccination? And that's really the question that she asked. And that's the question that in effect would have gotten her censored in the sense that nobody wants to know this because this has long-term implications. So um, as I said here, this is the, the paper. I've made it a bit bigger so you can see it. So the, she was just highlighting here the messenger RNAs for preventing SARS-CoV-2 are widely used for their effect yet their effect on the gut microbiome is not known. She had noticed previously that low levels of bifidobacteria were linked with severe SARS-CoV-2 infections, as well as inflammatory bowel disease, C. diff infection, obesity and aging. And so the question was, does it have an impact? So they got about 34 subjects who they had collected their stool prior to vaccination, 
And one month after vaccination, they then looked at the relatively abundance of the same specific genus, bifidobacteria, in the gut. And that was the scientific question. That, that is proper science because it makes perfect sense. Would you see a similar pattern occurring? So when they then took the results for this, what they found was that the relative abundance of this genus significantly decreased to about half of the original va value after vaccination. So prior to vaccination, it was at about 1.13%, and after vaccination, it was at 0.64%. So that's a very significant decrease. Now, they did this one month after. Is it possible that it could have recovered down the line six months or a year down the line? Kind of like what happens with sperm. You see a, a, a fall in sperm counts within a month, which then a, a rebound after three months. So that is possible. And so it needs further research. It doesn't need this research to be censored. But it indicates that there is something occurring in the context of the microbiome, not just around infection, but also around vaccination. So here is one of the thoughts that I've had. And um, this is here is linking in with Carla Brogner's work, where what I'm suggesting here in this image, I've pulled this together so that um, I, I'm just getting my thoughts. I've got here lipid nanoparticle and I've got a spike protein. Here is a toxin-producing bacteria. Here are the bifidobacterium down here. Now, effectively what I'm saying is that maybe the spike protein can get inside some bacteria and then cause it to start producing toxins. But in reality, it's unlikely to be the spike protein. It's more likely to be the mRNA either from the lipid nanoparticle or the whole virus getting inside specific types of bacteria. Maybe they're reading the code differently and then they're producing toxins. And then these toxins will destroy these bifidobacteria. That's a possibility. Could it be the immune system? Because if you saw a transition after maybe six months, maybe the levels came back up, could it have been that the immune system, for whatever reason, that the antibodies that were produced, for some reason, targeted these bacteria? That's another possibility. But whichever way we take it, there is a clear change in terms of the microbiome that occurs after vaccination, and we know it occurs in the context of infection. So here is where we have a big problem. because vaccination was not de developed to stop infection. It was there to protect against severe disease. And what we're having is high levels of vaccine breakthrough infections. And in many people, it's asymptomatic. So they don't even know when they've got an infection. So if every time they're getting these infections, they're having damage to specific parts of their microbiome, the long-term implications of this are, are horrific. They, they're frightening to consider because you need a healthy microbiome in order for your body to function well. It's, it's, not, it, it's, a, it's a very important part of how your body works. It works in conjunction with the microbiome. And when you have depletion of a good microbiome, not only will it not produce as much energy, for the intestine, but it increases the risk of bacterial overgrowth where those very toxic, like the Clostridium difficile, can then overgrow and cause far more severe infection. And so if that is the case, we can expect to see the C. diff cases rising exponentially over the next few years because of this ongoing damage to the microbiome. And so again, just in summary about this um, paper, this here is the abstract of it. And as I said, they found that there were low levels of bifidobacterium linked with severe disease. And you can't see this properly, but when you look at it here, the blue line 
is before, the red line is after. You have to look closely. But you can see clearly within a month, there is a significant fall off, almost 50% drop in terms of this specific um, bifidobacteria. So important piece of research that needs further research for us to be able to understand it. So that's essentially all I'll be saying today. And again, I remind you, you really need to listen to this discussion. It was absolutely fascinating. And again, final reminder, please remember Coming Heroes, 23 uh, hours to go. Even if you are seeing this beyond the date, please register. You'll get our newsletter, exciting things coming in the pipeline. Join us. Again, COVID-19 uh, 360 either the course or the recording, please make sure you've gotten as much information as you can. So thank you all very much. I appreciate you listening in and have a great evening.